we would like you to write an article for a classical singer um, from the perspective of somebody who teaches voice at a conservatory and teaches students and looks for students because they're applying uh, for their admissions. And also because you're a parent whose child is looking for a school for vocal performance. So they said, we want you to write an article based on that. And it made me sit down and think that you all get a lot of information, how to apply, what to sing, um, how to manage all of this. But I'm not so sure you get a lot of information on how to manage school and how to manage careers, even at your level and to make decisions. So there may be some parents here uh, with us. And I always ask students who come in to visit, visit me at Eastman to take a sample lesson. Um, are your parents musicians or are they normal people? So there's a difference uh, in that way. Uh, there's a great pride in being a musician and there's great pride in having a parent who's a normal person because, because they buy the tickets. They sit in the audience and we need them, right? They pick you up at rehearsal, bring you lunch, whatever. So I think with that, it started me on a plan to write this article. And what I've done today is I've made a little PowerPoint so that we can kind of go through some of the really important things I think for parents to know and for their classical singers who they love so much to know and the ability to have a conversation together. Uh, and please uh, feel free at the end to ask some questions and just unmute yourself by the time we get done, make sure we have some time. So, it's kind of in the sense that you as young classical singers are starting your careers and your parents need to sort of learn in a way how to mentor and help you along that way. So there's a sign and this is the sign that hangs outside my studio door at Eastman and it says learning to sing is a journey. It's not a race. And I have four really important things that I say to everyone, talent, persistence, hard work, and bravery. Those are our four studio words. And I love this picture because someone's trying to harness the moon, which is almost impossible, but you see so many different ways that the moon comes into this picture. And I like to think that there's a lot of different ways that you will all have your careers, especially in your generation. You won't have the same kind of way to build a career that I did long ago when I started singing. So I'll tell you very briefly that I started off as a speech pathologist, working with uh, children who had something that was being discovered called learning disability and children with voice disorders. I sang and enjoyed singing and lived in New York City and worked in the clinics and the hospitals there. And then uh, went on to Juilliard for a while, the opera company, and my first job was at San Francisco Opera. So it was an odd kind of journey and not a typical one. So when we say how to begin, how do you start this journey? How do you start it? And of course, when I say it's not a race, you know that it takes a while to really develop all the skills that you'll need because not only are you developing this, but also your bodies are growing, your skills with singing are growing, and it's not a really fast way to make it. I think the first thing to do is go on lots of school websites. Think about the schools that you might be interested in, go and look what they say on the websites. And also, if you go on vacation and you're driving through a part of the country, uh, visit a college. I mean, you could have children as young as uh, eighth or ninth grade and say, Let's we're going to Williamsburg, let's drive and walk around William and Mary. So I think that's a really good idea so that you as singers and your parents get a really good idea of what kind of school you're interested in. Uh, take the college tours. Absolutely. The students will often give tours and it's a great chance to ask questions and to see what the lay of the land is. And for parents, let the students take the lead. 
let them take the lead. Please be aware of the fact that yes, they may walk four blocks ahead of you and pretend they don't know you and that's okay because they're making those decisions and they're looking, right? But you'll all come together as a group to really figure out what the best choice is for them. Uh, try to visit schools during performance weeks. Now, here's my non-COVID lecture, right? Because we've had some issues. Of course, the world is topsy-turvy, but hopefully we're getting back to normal, uh, whatever that new normal may be. In the fall, uh, when we were online, many schools are coming back in person. We were in person for voice lessons. Uh, some of the teachers decided to do that, and I did and some classes were online. So schools will have different protocols in place. But if you can, watch things online. Many schools put really cool productions and things online. You can see their creativity, their recitals, their productions, their concerts, all kinds of things I think are a really great way to start this. So when you go to visit a school, ask for sample lessons or meetings with faculty in a really timely way, meaning give somebody at least two weeks notice. I've had emails that said, I'm coming on Wednesday and it's Monday night. And write your emails, don't text, do not text. Write emails because that way people can go back and really check what you want because Number three, the faculty really can't meet you on an audition day. We sit in a room from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. and listen to people say. And so you wouldn't want to meet me at 7.30 because my ears will be like this and I can't really concentrate and give you the energy that I would want to. So maybe if you're going to do auditions in person, I think a lot of the screening will be online again next year, but there may be, with any luck, some in-person lessons and in-person auditioning. Um, schedule another travel day so that maybe you can stay overnight and have a lesson with the teacher that you're interested in. And this is really important too. Make a list of questions you want to ask. Put them on a card or on your phone or a piece of paper. Who, what you want to ask the teachers, what you want to ask admissions, what you want to ask uh, students who do the guided tours. And if you're not really sure what to ask, Talk to your voice teacher. You ask about the program. You ask about the teacher's philosophy and ask about the courses and the things that you'll do. All these are really great questions. I'll never forget a student who came one time and came in with her mom and we were in the room and the mother talked all the time. And until the mom left, and there were great questions and important questions, but they were also questions that the student could have asked. And I think that's really important because your generation of young singers is going to be really in charge of going out and being part of keeping the arts alive. You're gonna be singing at parties. You're gonna be meeting at dinners with patrons. This is, and you know, some of us are really introspective, you know. It, it, it's hard for us, we're shyer or introverted, um, but it's, it's something, a skill that we have to uh, develop. You, we can't really go in and shake people's hands now, we kind of touch elbows, right? But uh, that's a big part of it uh, in that way. And talk to the admission staffs because a lot of your generation is really interested in double majoring. And I think that's a really good thing too. So you'll be able to see how the coursework would fit in with your plan there. So here's some other things to, con to uh, consider too as part of that. How to interview a teacher, how your confidence reflects to that teacher and the questions that you ask, have the teacher feeling, this is a kid I'd be interested in teaching. This is a kid I'd be interested in following up with. This is a young woman or a young man who really has an idea of how to be a self-starter because when you're a singer and a musician, you are the head of your own company. You're gonna develop your career on your own, in your own way. So these are really important skills to have and nobody cares if, the, if their uh, questions are on your phone. 
Nobody cares. Now, I think this is really pretty important. Keep a journal. Some people love to journal, some people don't. But I think in the audition process, you should keep a journal, whether you write it down or whether you put it on the top of your laptop. I went to this school. This is who I talked to. This is what I loved. This is what I didn't. <gasps> I forgot to ask this. I'm going to write to the teacher I had a sample lesson with or a teacher I would be interested in. And I'm going to ask them that question. Okay, with a really nice formal dear miss or dear sir email. Now, what's really important for parents that are on this with us, you don't say what you think of the school, and this is my opinion, you don't say what you think of the school until your student writes down what he or she thinks. It's really important to have that because that journal will provide you later on with what you're going to do to narrow down which schools they want to go to. Their initial impression. You'll never remember, you know, the five or six places you went. It's so hard to remember those kinds of things, the details. And so when you get financial offers and when you get teacher uh, preferences, you'll be able to go back to your journal and remember what you thought. It's really important. I think that's a really helpful thing. And I send all my undergrads when they go to look for grad schools, if they want to leave and go to a new school, I ask them to do that too. So it's really, really important. And I would also start to brainstorm about what your admission essays are gonna be about. So you have a lot of time maybe to prepare this depending where everybody is in their journey, but you know, make sure you do your initial screenings early. Um, there can be delays for illness. Suppose you're in you know, the musical and you get sick and you have only one week to record. So you wanna really do some really, really good planning ahead of time um, and get yourself really ready so that you feel comfortable. So in the next slide, I wrote some things down that I think are really important for a foundation. Part of the things that we're gonna to go to. Keep up with your academics. Keep up your grades. Really important. Um, take music courses and you know, participate in all kinds of musical activities that you can. I mean, you all now know how to sing masked. May we never have to sing masked again, but we might have to. So what I would do is have my students practice singing in the practice room without a mask and practice in the practice room singing with a mask, just to get used to that kind of feedback. Take piano lessons. Keep up with your instrument. If you're not playing an instrument at this time, I would strongly suggest you take piano lessons in the summer. It's music learning. It's keeping that musical brain alive so that you can learn your own music. And the biggest mistake, especially music theater majors make, is they learn their music off YouTube. Nope. Learn to be the best musician you can be in preparing your auditions. Take a dance class, take an acting class. This is all a big part of what we do as performers. Um, really take your, your high school uh, language studies seriously. You might be doing Spanish, you might be doing French, you might be doing German or Italian. Maybe your school doesn't really offer a lot of languages. You'll be taking those in college, but keep working on foreign languages. That's really, really important too. And an ideal situation, I, I really love what our school does. I think Oberlin does it, uh, DePaul might do it, a couple of schools where you have an entire year of Italian, an entire year of German, an entire year of French. And with that course comes the diction course that accompanies it. So you really live a language for a whole year, which is the way to go, right? Um, and then I, I put down, because it's just kind of fun, sing your DNA. So I have a rule in my studio that everybody um, in their senior recital has to sing something based on their DNA. And I've been doing this for the last 10 years and it's really fun because not only are people exploring 
their ancestry and their DNA. Um, and they're also learning things uh, that others have presented on their recitals. So someone said to me, uh, I'm Polish, but I'll never forget this, but I'm Polish, but nobody at home taught me how to speak Polish because my grandmother and mother didn't want me to know what they were saying. I said, well, you go to that grandma and sit her down and make her help you learn some Polish songs, right? So I just think it's a really, really fun exercise to do uh, because it also informs your classmates too about what you can bring. There's so many books now being printed uh, with Korean art songs, Chinese art songs, in addition to French melody, black composers, um, and really great, great uh, things are being published now that we have a real commitment to diversity in our classical music world, which is really great. So I think there are some important singer life skills and you can practice them in high school. And one of them is to be independent. It's the biggest challenge I see for parents and students, teaching your child to be independent. It is true that there are a number of schools that have rules that once students come for orientation, the parents must leave. It is true that there are parents that stay in bed and breakfast for at least three or four days following that, to check on their children. Encourage that independence. And I can tell you this, I see it reflected in the way students work. And I can also tell you that when we took my son to college, I cried all the way home, right? So in this independence, that's what you're going to need as a skill as a young singer. And you're also going to make sure that you contact teachers and you look for teachers that might be of interest to you. And that you know how to email in a formal greeting, an appropriate greeting. So writing an email that says, hey, I'm coming is not appropriate, right? We get it. Everything's a little more in a formal way when you're auditioning. Um, one of my friends, Jen Elmer, who teaches at um, Carnegie Mellon gave a class before this and she said, make sure what you wear is comfortable and is more professional. And that's what we have to think about when we perform. So great thing to do is get a summer job and work to save colleges or save in the future for summer programs. Um, my son took a lot of his uh, high school graduation money and stuck it in a CD because he said, I want to go someday to find Luciano Pavarotti's grave and stand there and get my picture taken next to Luciano Pavarotti and in his hometown, because he was his hero. And that's what he did. So that budgeting and practicing how to manage money is a really good skill to talk over with your young classical singer and to talk over with your parents. Um, others find other things that you're good at. Most musicians will have, you know, extra jobs to do while you're working, especially as we're coming out of COVID. A lot of my grad students are nannying, they're doing web construction, they're learning coding, technical things, they're working in different capacities. Uh, it's always good to have an extra skill like that. And you really want to write a good resume even though you might not have anything on it right now, except high school stuff, but that's okay. And get a good headshot and get a date book. Now, do we know what a date book is? That's a book online or in the physical presence where you write down what your schedule is. Because the worst thing, and we're gonna talk about it, the biggest challenge for all college kids when they come is time management. It's a huge, huge challenge for everyone. But I'll get into that a little more. So there's just a few other things that we want to think about. So these resumes, as I said, you might not have much on it, but you're going to proofread, proofread, proofread. 
You're going to give it to somebody else to proofread so that your everything's spelled well. Um, I'll never forget my total embarrassment when we had to print out the first year that I was a teacher and I thought, oh, my students are doing great. They're all ready for their first jury. And uh, my first student walked in and she said that she was going to sing an aria by handle, but spell check said H-A-N-D-L-E. That's on the door, right? A door handle. And I thought, oh gosh, because I kept saying spell check, spell check. So actually what happened and she didn't realize it was spell check, change the name of handle. So I say now proofread, don't spell check, right? Because you never know. Um, sometimes people like their photo on the top. For now, put your classical and your music theater things that you do together. Make sure everything's really clear and you're gonna develop some repertoire lists. Gauge them like French songs, German songs, music theater, uh, opera arias, which you won't have many and that's appropriate. So you have everything to start off building your repertoire list for your new teacher. Oh, uh, just pop some, here we go, okay. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about finding the right teacher and the right school. Because just because a friend is going to a certain school doesn't mean that's your school. You have to find the best school for you. Sometimes it might be a small liberal arts college. Sometimes it might be a big university. Sometimes it might be in a big city. Sometimes it might be in a small nurturing environment. Everyone has a different feeling and comfort level about that. And that's where you start making your notes, right? In your journals about that, right? What you're gonna feel. Finally, right teachers are really important, really important consideration for this journey. So I think the most important thing is to take an informational lesson with somebody. A lot of us are doing it online, you know? And what's a good lesson? Well, a good lesson with a potential new teacher is to give you information about the strengths and the challenges that you'll have to address. So I may say, what a beautiful warm tone. I love that your music is really accurate. Um, I would work on maybe feel, making have you feel, for example, more strong as you access into the top of your voice. So I'm giving you feedback on two different things, right? I'm giving you feedback what I really liked and what I would work on if I was your teacher. And if your teacher is an active performer, ask about how they make up lessons when they go away. So for 10 years, when I first started teaching, I was still performing. And I would have a, a process where I would make up my lessons before I would go away. I would FaceTime my students every week. I would have my teacher come in for a week in, or two and teach for me. So I knew that technically my students would be in a really good uh, way, um, but there are a lot of performer teachers. And I think that's a really important question to ask what their plan is uh, in that way. Okay, now audition repertoire. You have heard tons about this. So I'm just gonna really say that there's lots of classes, on uh, articles online, classical singer, all good. Um, teachers, uh, sometimes I give this class for teachers and I always say that you shouldn't feel the pressure to assign really big arias and difficult repertoire for college auditions. College auditions judge potential. Now, I also know that big opera arias sometimes win scholarship prizes in high school, fancy, coloratura, big, you know, pieces, but they also can undermine you technically if you're really not up to it. So find a group of six potential songs and learn a group of six songs. So what I tell my high school students. And from that pool of repertoire, we're gonna pick the three you're gonna audition in college. Because if you sing those three college application pieces for two years to get ready to go to college, they are gonna be the most boring, stale pieces that you are gonna be so sick of. So what you wanna do is develop a little group of songs that you can learn and pick from. 
and see, you know, what is the best for you, what feels more comfortable as you're learning uh, new things. And there's lots of teachers, I think, on this um, classical singer that have talked about potential, how we manage and choose audition repertoire, right? So here's some other things to remember. If you're on time, you're five minutes late. You get there, you get there a little bit early, five, 10 minutes early, you sit down, you check your binder, are you all set to go? You sit quietly, you get your head in the right place. There's nothing worse than running in as if your pants are on fire, right? You got to get everything ready to go so that your brain can get in a really good musical place. Plan your outfit, shoes that are comfortable. Don't buy new shoes for auditions and then never wear them. We've seen some high heel disasters walking across our beautiful stage because they were really new shoes, right? So wear something comfortable, find a dress you really love, find a suit that feels really comfortable. Um, that's really, really part of making yourself feel empowered to sing well, when you feel like you really look great and it's really comfortable to wear. Do not bring your water bottle on the stage. Do not bring your water bottle on the stage and gulp it between every piece you sing. They will think that you have to have an opera role that involves holding a glass of water, right? It's kind of crazy, but it's part of our nervous energy, right? You can keep your bottle off to the side if you cough or something, but just don't, I mean, I've seen kids bring water bottles on and put them at their feet. All I'm doing is watching that water bottle because I think they're going to move and kick it, right? So it's kind of crazy, but um, I thought I would mention it because I've seen it more than mm, 15 times, okay? So that I thought it's significant. And practice introducing yourself. This seems really wacky. Practice introducing yourself and the name of the first piece you're going to sing. You want to say um, Caro mio ben, or Gial sole dal gange, with a really beautiful sense of the Italian. And you want to speak your name without tripping over it or getting nervous. So every time you practice, practice speaking, right? In my studio classes, we have a class every week, a performance class. Everybody comes in, they announce who they are, and they, of course, know who they are because we've seen them for four years. But we have them say their name, the name of their accompanist, and what piece they're going to sing. It's really good practice for concerts in the future. Okay. So, ah, so what do you do while you wait for all these admission things? Some of you may be waiting now to hear from school. Some of you may be deciding. Um, and some of you may be graduating or in the, on your ninth, in your uh, 11th grade year, you know, you've got this summer to, to think about things. Look for really good opportunities to perform. Use your repertoire to help. So my son and his best friend who played the guitar, they were waiting to go to college and they were waiting and waiting and waiting. So in February, before all the acceptances came out, they decided they would put together a recital for a hospice that was across the street from their high school. And they did a benefit and they used all the music that they were going to use for their auditions. And then they learned duets to sing together. And so that really created something that kept their love for performing alive. We talked about grades, um, learn to iron. I'm not kidding you. Learn to sew on a button, learn to cook, get a part-time job, life skills. And find ways to really feed your creative. You know, if there's a summer music theater group, join it. You, you learn a lot. Um, participate in mats, or many of you probably will be sending in your videos to Classical Singer. Great, you get feedback. That's the best part of it, right? You get some good feedback. Um, learn about your voice. So here's the thing. If I asked all you guys, and I don't see some of you because some of you are, uh, are don't have your uh, pictures on, but I always ask um, 
the first day of my vocal pedagogy class, which I teach to the seniors at my school, how many people have sung an Italian art song? Everybody's hand goes up, right? I say, okay, keep your hands up. How many of you have sung a French melody? How many of you have sung a song by an English composer? Mm -hmm. How many of you have sung a German lead? Mm -hmm. How many of you can tell me what the names of the cartilages of your larynx are? You think a pianist doesn't know what those three pedals are for? So that's a cool way to get a small vocal pedagogy book and start to learn about how your voice works, how it works. And listen to all types of music, jazz and music, theater and classical. I mean, I love Ella Fitzgerald. If you wanna learn about phrasing and you know, listen to the great, great singers of the past. Listen to the great singers of the past. They are part of your tradition, both musical theater and classical. Learn poetry, volunteer backstage. Um, all these things are really good things to do because singing isn't only about how you sound. If you read a really great novel that becomes an opera, all the better. So a lot of this is educating yourself as a musician and that involves more than just learning how to sing. So here are the three three biggest challenges that I see for students when they come in for their freshman year. And the first one is time management. It's really hard. Um, and I say, get a date book so that you have a book and you begin to write things down. It's very, very actually important. I know you guys will be doing it on your phone or on your computer. Don't wait for the notice that says, oh, something's due today. <sighs> Get your book and be able to see, or on your phone, the month schedule so that you can look ahead. So you might say, oh gosh, I have that week of production week. I mean, you're in town at school, but I also have to make a screening and it's due on Friday and I will have no day that I will have off. I will be singing all the time. I better make my screening CD the week before when I'm not so tired, right? or my paper is due on Friday, I've got to look at what I can start on the Friday before. So this time management allows you not to miss rehearsals, not to be late and to be prepared. And you've got to be prepared for rehearsals because that really sets you apart, even at your age, really, really important. This is huge, learn how to practice. And one of the great voice teachers, William Bernard said, it's only by learning the secret of practicing that there's any possibility of learning to sing well. Because I believe personally that too many of us, and I'll include myself in this, too many of us sing for a really long time on talent alone. And then comes the reckoning day when you get older, and so many of my colleagues, when they got into their late 30s, early 40s, they began to have vocal issues, some vocal trouble, because they didn't have the technical expertise, didn't work hard on that in the beginning. And I think that's paramount. That's your big job in this time working forward. Technically, become technically and linguistically secure and learn repertoire. So, don't be one of those singers. Be always interested in your technical things. Write your exercises down. Let your teacher give you a sheet of what he or she wants you and how they want to practice. Talk to your teacher. One of my freshmen came in um, this semester, last semester, and I said, how are you? Oh, I'm really good. I got a practice room, so I've been singing for an hour before my lesson. Right? So I said, oh, boy. I forgot to say, don't do that. Play the piano, do your theory, sing a little bit. Translate your Italian, sing a little bit more. So how to practice, how to make the most of that practice session is really important. And to develop patience because boy, oh boy, it takes patience. And it's so frustrating sometimes because your musical brains are so far ahead of what this can do. You all are, 
right? You're here. You are here. So someone will come and say, oh, I love that aria from Traviata. And I'll say, ooh, I love that aria from Traviata too. So in 20 years, I hope I'll hear you sing it in the opera house. But we can take some sections of that Sempre Libra aria that that student loves, and we can sing a little bit and make up some vocalizing and learn about the score and listen to great people singing. Uh, Maria Callas, Elena Contrabash, let's listen to some great Mirella Franey singing those roles to learn about great singers of the past. So this is a very important thing to keep healthy meditation Get counseling if you need it. If you need the support, this is a very tough business. And we're in the ins and outs of this COVID world. And we've all been depressed. We've all been feeling defeated at some time. Or you're not a human being, right? So get that support. And if you are someone who struggles with a disability, please inform the school. The school will set up uh, things to help you. And even as a teacher, I have some students who have dyslexia. It's really hard for them when they come to Italian. So we have strategies where we blow up the music a little larger so they can visualize it a little bit better. We have strategies and ways to help. So I saw this picture with Michael Jordan and I had to put it in. I just added it last night. Because, you know, sometimes singing is like basketball. You know, you got to get to those high notes, right? So I loved what he said. People didn't believe me when I told them I practiced harder than I played. But it was true. That's where my comfort zone was created. By the time the game came, all I had to do was react to what my body was already accustomed to doing. It's really, really important. It's not always about the competition or the show or the recital. It's the work that you do, you know, two steps forward, a step back. This progress that you make and checking in with your teacher about all those things that are very valuable. We've gone over everything really, really fast. Um, and so I was interviewed for Classical Singer. Um, they did a, a group of teachers who were interviewed and um, they asked what my philosophy was. And this was what I said. I think that we have to learn our technical information and get secure. Because if we really feel secure, we can be brave. And aren't the singers that you love kind of brave? They're very unique, they're individual. Um, then once we have those really secure strategies, we can really discover some things about ourselves. Maybe it means for you guys, getting your noses out of the scores, memorizing everything you sing, creating little recitals, being brave. Um, I think that's a, a very tough thing sometimes for us because we're always thinking of what we need to do better. You already do a lot of things really well. And I think this is what I would say to you and what I would say to your parents who are helping you negotiate this, that there's a lot of this sometimes, not only in the performing arts, but also in law, in medicine, there's a lot of challenges and a lot of talent. And, um, but nobody could doubt your excitement about this world um, because singing is a pretty wonderful way uh, to spend your life and a life in music will take you in so many different directions. I will end by saying that I got an email this morning telling me that one of my students who graduated about five or six years ago just got into Yale Medical School. She wants to be an otolaryngologist. I was just as proud of her than the email I got the night before from a student who said, I just got Pamina at Pittsburgh Opera. So we find our, our, our live and music in very many places we could never imagine. So I hope maybe some of the things that I've talked about maybe were helpful. And um, I think there's a few questions. So let me just stop this.
and see maybe there were some questions Danielle, in the chat was there something didn't see any questions oh. but that was an awesome presentation i really oh just giving our thoughts yeah anybody have any questions just to unmute yourself and let us know no question is um too unimportant either parents or singers yeah anything now there had to be something i said that doesn't make sense my son tells me that all the time you don't make any sense so this has to be something that doesn't make sense or there has to be something that you thought yeah i've been thinking that does anybody want to share that remember what i said brave is my favorite word yeah i love brave Alexandra? Oh, um, Leah, you can go ahead if you want to. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. You cleared up many things. But I have a question. In our COVID time, when would it be better to try to take a trial lesson with somebody? Would it be in the summer or in the early fall? Well, I think schools are going to have different rules. And you know what, Leah, it's a great question because I wish I had an answer. So for example, our school intends to be fully present uh, and we haven't really been told, you know, uh, what our policy will be for in-person lessons. We're going to have some tours, I know, but we've now closed our school so only students can come on campus and that's kept us really going. We've never had to shut down we never had to go online. Uh, so it would be, that's a really good question. I think you could possibly wait to the fall and see, but now we know that, I mean, a hundred percent just about of any teacher in an academic setting will have Zoom possibilities. So if they aren't able to see you in person, you can certainly Zoom in and have a sample lesson. We just don't know. But uh, uh, continue. Yeah, no, I was going to say we, we just don't have any idea. So having alternatives is always important. Yeah. Alexandra, did you want to add something? Yes, thank you. Um, one thing that you discussed in detail was time management and um, how important it is to keep up with academics in addition to pursuing musical opportunities. And I was just wondering if um, you have any suggestions or advice for high school students who, like me, are maybe struggling to manage both academics and their musical yeah. pursuits. And you are all struggling at a very uh, high rate. And that is not lost on academia what's happened this year. The ability for some students to work on their own is varied. There would be nothing better than to be in the classroom, in your school, you know, online. The example I can give is that uh, I teach a course of vocal pedagogy and I said, I can't test because, you know, I don't know if someone would be cheating or someone would be using their book. So I'm going to just make projects. And I said, okay, I'm going to give you projects and you have to have them in on time for full credit. Within two months, I changed that. And I said, you don't have to have them in full time for full, you know, for full credit. But you have to have them in within the month because I didn't realize what other teachers were giving and they were giving them a lot of work too. So you have to do your work in a timely way. So I think the idea of keeping up the best that you can, if you struggled, you know, you have opportunities in your admissions to say, I struggled with this this year, but I was successful in this. And so while I think that, you know, um, we're looking at grades only because we want people who are not doing, uh, work that would put them in a C minus or a D category. I mean, that's just not going to work in college. It's just not going to work. But, you know, we think about SATs. Some people, when they used to require those, some people were really good at them. And I'm here to tell you that I got a 725 in English and a 410 in math. I was terrible at math. 
And it probably was not really looking good way back when, when I applied to college, when dinosaurs still roamed the earth, because that's how old I am. But um, it probably wasn't good, but it also told people that I was struggling in math and um, I did my best, but my other things, my other scores were really high. So I think that we are all very aware of what you've been all been through and the struggles of sometimes high school's closing, sometimes you're there. So Alex, it's a, it, Alexander, it's a really good question. And I think I would say to keep up your work to the best of your, of your ability. And if you struggle with something, say, I struggled with this. And yeah, I think that's uh, honesty is the best policy, if that thank makes sense. Thank you so much. That's really yeah. helpful. Good, 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 good. Wonderful. Thank you for your questions. We're running out of time, but there's uh, one more question in the chat. Uh, if we could answer that quickly. Uh, yes. but before that, do you have a contact information for anyone who would like to reach out to you after this class? Sure, 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 sure. Shall I put it in the chat? Yes, please. For uh, everyone. For everyone. Okay. This is the question. Is the undergraduate admission through Common App? Yes, we have that. We have that opportunity. Um, um, and is it test optional for 2021 to 2022. We at my school, other schools will be different. That's why you have to really check and, you know, really do detail, follow the rules, apply on time. Our school, I don't believe any, does not require SATs anymore. We don't. I don't believe we require um, any testing. We just want GPAs. So, well, I think that's. We're good. Wraps up everything. I that was a really enlightening presentation. Thanks again, um, Catherine Cowdrick. Thank you so much. And everyone else, the email is in the chat. So if you need to ask more questions, you can go ahead and shoot an email to her. All right. Well, I hope that you all are enjoying the expo so far, and just have a good rest of the day. Great. Hug your parents. Thank you so much. Bye, Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.